encourage you to find your seats. We have some Advent stuff uh, happening. This is the first week of Advent. I know last week I told you there were two weeks, but you can't ever trust anything I say that I hadn't planned on saying. Um, if you have not picked up one of these books, you are not too late. You can go through these books um, starting today, and even if you had started late, uh, better late than never is still a good policy to apply. So pick one of these up. If there's somebody, friend, family member who doesn't get out much and you want to bring this to them, um, uh, I think there's still a good amount up here and available. So uh, you don't have to ask me. The answer is yes, okay? We're trying to do one per household just to make sure they last, but we still have a good number there. So get them while they're hot. Um, I want to go ahead, and before we light our Advent candle this week, uh, I want to go ahead and just uh, pray and, and settle our hearts and, and invite the Spirit to be with us this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness, which allows us to be together. We think of those who aren't with us this morning. We ask that your spirit would be with them every bit as much as it's with us in this place. Be with those who may be watching online, who are sick or just unable to be here, Lord, who are traveling. Father, as we move into this time of Advent, we pray that we would be, we would be coming into a realization of who you are more and more each day, that something would awaken in us, that Advent, the awakening, that, that somehow we would uh, feel your presence in a special way, and that you would be revealed to us um, again, that we may glorify you by becoming more like your son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, before we go into a time of worship, we ask the Lard family to go ahead and come, and, and they're going to read a scripture for us and light the Advent candle. I didn't set you up for this, but I'll tell you what, any purple candle today will be perfect. All right. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the later days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be excelled, exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of, the, of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. I went away. I'm back. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. You can have a seat. Jill is going to help by reading the all portion, and that's the part that you will read, the all portion. Uh, and, and I'll do my best here at the, the reader's side. The light is coming. We can see glimpses of pink and orange along the horizon, but the sun isn't up yet. Advent is the season of the dawn. There are still long stretches of shadow and places of darkness. The noises of the day are just barely audible as everything and everyone begins to rise. Advent is the season of the dawn. We live in the space between the darkness of a world without Christ and the light of a world with Christ. We see the light coming, yet it hasn't fully come. Advent is the season of the dawn. While we observe this season of Christ's birth and the coming of light, we are reminded that we are still an Advent people. We live in the glow of the dawn, 
We are no longer people of darkness. We are people of the light, even while Christ's return is still before us. We are people of the dawn. On the first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope, a reminder of hope we have in Christ, who came in a, in a stable so long ago, but it's also a reminder of the hope we have that Christ will come again. We are people of the light in a world that is so often cloaked in darkness. We are people of the light. We have hope that the light has come and that the light is coming. Lord, help us remember that we are people of the dawn, a people of hope. In the places that still harbor darkness, help us to shine your light. And in the places that are already illuminated with your light, help us rejoice. Help us cling to hope through it all. Amen. One more section here. Lord, help us remember that we are people of the dawn. You know what? That's the same that we just read. It just got repeated. Amen. All right. In that, in that case, why don't we just get ready for, uh, why don't we just get ready to worship this morning? I want to invite you to go ahead and stand.
And it is so great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I know that we could all stand and give testimony to God's faithfulness in our lives. Um, this morning, we are going to take a moment just to greet our neighbor. Maybe you can share how God has been faithful to you this week. Um, but at this moment, just say hello and greet your neighbor. Well, as you make your way back to your seat this morning, I have a full list of things taking place over the course of this next month coming up in December. Um, Gavin already mentioned this is the first Sunday of Advent, um, starting our Christmas season. And so don't, don't forget to grab your Advent book that's up here at the front. We like to go through this as a church family, just walking through the Advent season together and being on the same page. So make sure you grab your book, One Per Household, um, or if you know someone who needs one, come and grab one for them. Um, December 4th at 6 p.m., we have our Christmas wreath-making party. Um, you can sign up in the foyer. That just gives the, the Women's Ministry Council an idea of how many women to plan for, or not just women, anybody who wants to come make a wreath. Um, a supply list has been placed out there, um, as well as in your mailboxes. So you'll see this green paper too many things in my hands here. Um, this green paper here um, just gives a list of all the things that you need to be able to make that wreath. There's also an example out in the main foyer. So as many people as possible, everyone is invited. It's going to be a great time of fellowship, um, so don't miss that. December 4th, 6 p.m., the Christmas wreath-making party. Um, the teens are having a Christmas party as well, Saturday, December 10th, from 2 to 5 p.m. Um, I believe it's an ugly sweater Christmas party. So make sure to wear your ugliest sweater. I don't know how often we get to say that, but wear your ugliest clothes to the party. Um, Sunday, December 11th is our Gifts for Jesus. Uh, we'll be taking up an offering that will go towards Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Christmas Project. So, um, starting next Sunday, we'll kind of have a little paper out talking about what that offering entails. And it really goes to the church in Lebanon, who has struggled a lot. They actually have a Nazarene school um, in one of the cities there that assists a lot of students. And so this offering is going to be going to help that school, to help our Nazarene churches there. Um, and then a portion of that offering also goes to help some in our congregation who just need help during the Christmas season. So just be prepared for that. Sunday, December 11th is going to be our gifts for Jesus. Um, and so with that, our final announcement, I just invite you to stand as we continue in worship this morning.
upon the seas and hung the stars and very breath inside our hearts and behold our God He is the anthem of our praise We were born to bless His name
God, we just thank you that your presence is here. That even before we step in this place, you have gone before us. God, you're a Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for that gift today. But God, more than anything, we praise you. There is so much in our lives to be thankful for the things that you fill us with hope for. And as we come to this season of Advent in, in anticipation of the birth of Jesus Christ, the gift that you gave us, Lord, help us not to take it for granted. Help us to think of what you have done for us in the past where you are with us right now in the present and what you're going to do in the future. God, we love you this morning. And we praise your holy name above every other name. As Pastor Gavin comes this morning, I pray that you would just fill our hearts with your message of hope. Remind us who you are. Remind us who we are as people who claim to be yours. God, you are so good. We love you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Kids, we're dismissed for Children's Church. Well, as the kids are making their way out and we prepare ourselves for the reading of scripture, which will come in just a little bit. Um, I want us to think about um, Advent in the way that our, our scripture reading or our, our, our candle reading did for us this morning, talking about um, an Advent as, as a time of an awakening or that something's coming and even related that to sunrise. Um, you know, I'm not really a sunrise person. Um, there are sunrise people out there. I don't know who they are. I don't understand them. Uh, I'm more of like a sunset, midnight person. I don't really, I do my best to be in bed still at sunrise, um, but I, I have seen the sunrise on a few occasions. Um, I remember one time in particular, I was at a wedding in, in L.A., and uh, somehow uh, the rooms that were for the groomsmen were, were like done that night. So we said, okay, great. So we just hopped in the car at about uh, 11.30 p.m. and just drove straight back to Oklahoma City. Uh, but I remember as I was driving um, and uh, making my way into uh, Arizona, uh, one of the guys in the back seat who'd been asleep for several hours wakes up. He's like, oh, man, let's stop somewhere and get breakfast. I said, it's 4 in the morning. Um, in Arizona, you can get, you can get lighter before because they don't do the daylight savings uh, time as it would have been in the summer. But I remember uh, driving and, and, and being able to see so clearly the sun wasn't even up, but being so clearly able to see that my friend is like, yeah, it's, it's breakfast time because it's morning. And I said, no, it's only four. And um, that, that's, that's what Advent's like. That's what this hope is like. We, we can see, okay, we begin to see the rays of sunshine. We can see, okay, I've got some some, you know, some of the shadows are being chased away, and I can start to see what's on the hill line or um, what, what's off in the distance. I can begin to see those things, and um, sometimes sun rises can be as beautiful as sunsets, and you begin to see the different colors going across the sky, and you think, um, man, this is amazing. But the sun isn't actually up yet. We're still in that anticipation. And so um, we think about Advent, um, that wait, that time of, of anticipation and um, realizing that we're kind of caught in this time where we can, we can see the effects of Christ's coming, right? We can see, we know that we have new life, that we have hope for a future, that we have salvation, we have uh, transformation, all possible because Jesus Christ did come. And yet we still live in a world full of brokenness and sinfulness and and we're waiting for Christ to come in his fullness, what we call the second coming of Christ. So we're in that anticipation, and we're reminded of that each and every single Advent season. Um, so last week we spoke about God's promises, um, how they uh, create, and you know what? We're on, I'm on last week's deal. That's two weeks ago that we were on uh, talking about God's promises. Um, 
but this week we'll be speaking about uh, hope for the Advent season and what it's like to be a people who live in that hope. Um, But we did two weeks ago speak about promises and the hope of promise and how whenever those promises come, they bind us uh, to certain responsibilities. And the same happens with uh, hope of Advent or the hope of the Christmas season. We think, oh, maybe this will happen this year. This will be the year I get that big bonus, that Christmas bonus. Anyone ever anticipate a Christmas bonus at the end of the year? I know in some parts of the country, they expect a 13th paycheck. So they get paid monthly. They expect a whole full paycheck uh, in addition to uh, what they normally receive at Christmas time. Um, and that was always hard to deal with in a system where we don't do that. We say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not giving you a whole extra paycheck. Um, but we start to imagine, um, any, anytime we think of a bonus or something coming in, we start to imagine what we're going to do with that money. We, we start to live as if... Um, as if we are, that money already comes. And, you know, I, I want to give a disclaimer before I share about this movie. I only saw the TV version, the network TV version of this movie. Um, and, and I recently uh, started to watch the non-TV, non-network TV version of it. Um, uh, and I, I, I stopped watching it, but uh, quickly on there. But, but in this, in this and, I, and you'll have to guess, I'm not going to give you the name. But in this uh, Christmas, the guy, uh, this Christmas season, the guy's anticipating a Christmas bonus, and he's going to put in a pool, right? So he's got all the pamphlets. He's excited. He knows what's going to happen. Yeah, it's pool time. He's living it up. He's all, all excited. And then what he gets instead is a subscription to the Jams and Jelly of the Month Club. So if you can think about, anyway, so that's a, anyway, so you know that one. Anyway, but, uh, but we begin to live like it's Christmas time. And, and I want to encourage you, uh, maybe not with the Christmas bonus, but in this Advent season, I want to encourage you to go all out, to live as if in four weeks, four weeks, Jesus Christ will be here. I want us to live as if we just have a few days left and then Jesus will be here. And if we actually believe that, the way that we live will be so different. We'd be, we'd be going all out for Christ. And so I want us to consider what that might be like. Here's our big idea for the day, if you're following along with your notes, and you do have kind of a condensed version of your notes for this week, um, but you have space to fill in the blanks or to add stuff yourself if you're interested. Here's the big idea. Advent is a, Advent is a reminder that we are people of the light in a world that is so often cloaked in darkness. We're called to live, to love, to worship, to give, to serve, to celebrate, to mourn, to grieve. All of these things that we do, we do that in this in-between time. We do it in a space of hope. So we don't hope or we don't, we don't grieve as people who grieve forever. We grieve as people who realize that we're going to be grieving for a time and then there's going to be another day when there won't be any more grieving. We serve as people who realize that there's only enough, there's only a little bit of time whether my life ends or whether Christ comes back, we serve as if they just have a fleeting amount of time. We, 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 we're, we're pressed. We have, to, we have to serve the Lord. We have to serve our church. We have to serve our neighbor, others around us. We have to do this because there's, there's going to be a time when we don't get the chance to. The light has come and the light is coming. Um, with that said, we're going to look at a, a passage today that we don't typically consider a, a Christmas passage, uh, but this comes from Romans chapter 13. We'll read four verses here. Verse 11. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is already the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk decently as in the day, not in reveling and in drunkenness, not in illicit sex and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Um, I I love the idea here. He's saying it's time for you to wake up. You're you're, you're waking up now. Because as as Paul Paul puts it here in the letter to the Romans, he's saying, okay, um, you're closer now to Jesus' second coming than, than you ever were before. And that's true, and that's still true. Because they didn't know it then. In fact, they, they really thought Jesus was coming before they died. Um, and so Paul was, 
Paul was serving. He was on a mission. He was going everywhere, and everywhere he went, he would say, you know what? If you're not married, don't get married. Don't waste your time. If you are married, stay married and be a good husband or, or wife or spouse or whatever. Do that as best as you can, but don't, don't waste your time because Jesus is coming now. And so Paul is telling the Romans, hey, um, just so you know, uh, today, at the time of your reading this, you're even closer to that end time. You're even closer to that second coming of Christ. You're even closer to that salvation moment for the world than you ever were before. And every day that has passed, we could say the same thing. Every hour since Paul penned these words, we could say the same thing. And so I say the same thing to us today. We are closer to Jesus' second coming than anyone has ever been in the past. We don't know when he comes. He could be here in five minutes, five days, five years, 5,000 years, and that's still true. That we're closer to his coming than we've ever been before. And he wants, he's encouraging them to live that way. So for the early church, life was difficult. Um, they accepted Christ, but it didn't fix all their immediate problems, right? If I was, if I was poor and I didn't have any food and, and, and I was struggling, I didn't, I didn't have enough to get by and, and, and I accepted Christ, I may have found some sense of brotherly love and, and fraternity where, where people would share things with me and we were eating as a community, so at least Several times a week, I would have a meal that I didn't necessarily have to pay for and uh, provide for from my own pocket because we shared everything that we had in common. And, and yeah, maybe some of my neighbors or, or some of my um, brothers and sisters in Christ saw me without something and they provided for me. But the truth is, I'm still struggling. I'm still struggling. On a more spiritual level, those who were dealing with... Um, dealing with... Um, uh, worshiping idols in their past, and they leave that behind, and they think, okay, now I just pray to this new idol, and they struggle with, what does it mean now to follow Christ? So it's not as if, although many times when we give our lives over to Christ, we can see immediate change and transformation in our lives, and things get better immediately. That, that, that is true for us sometimes. There's also times we give our lives to Christ, and you know what? It's still hard. We still struggle with temptation. We still sin and, 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 and fall into what well, we feel we fall out of grace. And then we have to, we have to come to the Lord again and confess again and, 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 and grow in our faith. And so there's this struggle always happening. And they assumed, they assumed that, that, that perhaps if I accept Christ and I leave this old way, that everything will be different for me. And the truth was they were still people who lived in Rome in the first century. They still dealt with poverty and, and and insecurity and, and outside influences on their faith, and they didn't know what it was going to be like. They still had pain, death, injustice, suffering. All those things still existed. So people were converted to a radically different lifestyle. There was some urgency to it. You, 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 you don't have time. You need to make this decision now. Are you going to know Christ? Yes, I come to know Christ. And then now they're just waiting. I thought you said this was urgent. I thought you said Christ is coming soon. I thought you said there, were, there wasn't many days. I thought you said that the first generation of believers wouldn't pass away before Christ came, and yet they're passing away. What do you have to tell us now? Because we're waiting. We're stuck in anticipation, and it's difficult. And so we know suffering in this age as well. We're not, we're not, um, um, we're not uh, somehow saved or, or, or separated from suffering. We experience that every day. I know that, that this might be getting old to say, but people suffer during COVID time. Some of you suffered with COVID and, and, were, and were quite ill. Some of you lost someone. Certainly everyone in this church lost family, church members of this community of faith were lost to COVID. We know isolation and depression because of things being closed. Um, grief. Um, certainly, uh, inflation is an issue, and, 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 and now um, uh, the way the economy is going and, and people wondering if they're going to be able to make it and what's Christmas going to be like, what's Thanksgiving going to be like. All around just division as well as, as a people in this world and divided on political issues or social issues, uh, religious issues, and churches breaking apart in the last couple of years. And, and we wonder, man, when is... When is Jesus going to just come and fix all this? Wouldn't that be great if Jesus just came and fixed it all? 
I would love to not have to go through another election, like political election. Wouldn't that be great if you just came and it was like, let's pretend it's November 6th or whatever it was this year. If it's two years from now, it's something like that, November 4th or 8th or whatever it's going to be. And, and, and Jesus was just like, surprise, boom, and came the day before. I, would, I wouldn't be upset about that. I'd say, yeah, that's great. Jesus is here. We didn't have to go through that again. And man, that'd be fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if, if you never had to be sick again or you never had to wonder how you're going to pay a bill again, if you never stressed over finances? Wouldn't it be great if you never were, had a broken relationship ever again? Wouldn't it be great if Jesus was here and all that stuff was fixed? That would be fantastic. And yet we're people who are waiting. In every Advent season, we're reminded that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And here we are. We're, we're in this spirit of hopeful anticipation. So what's God going to do now? What's he going to do in us, through us? So Christians deal with this in-between time because we're familiar with the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection in our lives. Power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection. We can live through this time because we experience those things and they just give us enough. I'm not saying they give us another year till next Advent season, but when you experience the movement of the Spirit, that gives you enough to the next time when you're in desperate need of it. When, when, when you... When you experience the power of the resurrection and transformation in your life, then it is easier to say, okay, that, that charge my tank for a little while. There's that song, fill my cup, Lord, fill it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul, that old hymn. It, it, it's like our tank's getting filled up a little bit. We say, okay, we can make it a little while longer. We don't want to be selfish with those things, and yet we realize that we only make it it's because the Lord is sustaining us every day. And I, and I would say that any church that doesn't have outreach opportunities, any church that's not seeking to be a part of helping people know Christ who don't already know him, any church that's not ministering physically to people and not doing those things, our tank seems to run dry more quickly. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a community that way or if this church has ever gone through dry spells. But when we don't experience the power of the resurrection in people's lives, even if I experienced it in my neighbor's life and not in my own life or my, um, my friend or, or, or a fellow church member, um, even if I experienced the Holy Spirit doing something amazing in their life, that fills me up. It's, at least it should. It's meant to. And so when, we, we're, when we're a church that's not a, taking part in that, then our tank runs dry a lot more quickly and we have a lot more difficulty in, in dealing with this in-between time. Um, those who follow Christ are compelled to live as though he has already returned. Getting back to our notes there. Those who follow Christ are compelled to live as though Christ has already returned. And that's a difficult thing to do. We, we, we pretend. It's, it, 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 sometimes we feel like it's, it's disingenuine. And, and, you know, I, um, I spent five years ministering in, in Mexico. And, and, and one of the things they would always say um, and the churches there always, and, and, and these are Nazarene churches, they would always say, um, Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon. And I would always think like, not really. I mean, because we didn't, we didn't have the habit of saying that. Did you say that in, in your churches growing up? Or I, we never said that. And they would say that, and I kind of got to thinking like, is he really? Like, I, I don't know. But the, the idea is they were encouraging one another to live as if he was already here. To live as if the, the, the second coming had already taken place, as if Christ was, uh, we know he's been uh, dead and resurrected, but as if he was back here on earth and all the resurrection of the dead was taking place, and then we're, we're here living. Can you imagine how different we would live? And I know I've talked about this a number of times. If we knew Christ was coming back in, in, in one day, wouldn't we live so differently? Wouldn't we be a different people? And yet we're called to live that way. We want to remind each other, Christ is coming soon. So in this passage, he used, uh, Paul uses the metaphor of waking up. Hey, you need, to, you need to wake up. You know what time it is. Um, don't be sleeping. You don't want to be accused of, or not being accused, but you don't want to have been judged by Christ. Say, why did you sleep? I gave you um, 80 years on this earth, and, and, and for 65 of those, you followed me so closely. You were, you were, you were, uh, born-again believer, you were a disciple of Jesus Christ for 65 of those. Why did you sleep for 65 years? Could you imagine coming face-to-face -face with, our, with our creator and him saying, why did you sleep so long? Man, 
I don't want that to be me. At the same time, the, Paul also talks about it um, almost as um, almost as a meal or something. Um, uh, this is in, in an earlier passage. He speaks about having a meal and being ready. Um, but uh, we know that meals don't just come about together every every mother. I think I saw a meme during Thanksgiving time. You know, a meme. Uh, your a, pi- a picture with words on it that said time time for us to uh, time for every everyone every mom to cook for three hours so their kids can eat a roll on Thanksgiving. Um, if you feel all the preparation that goes into all the time and all the advanced uh, getting things ready and letting things thaw and 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 all the things that you do and then uh, the kids just eat a roll they don't enjoy it they don't they don't participate in the meal and it's frustrating. You don't want to be uh, on the other side of that where the Lord is frustrated with us. And although the Lord loves us, He gives us grace and mercy over and over again. He's willing to call us and woo us and, 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 uh, and be patient with us. Still doesn't mean He's not frustrated or, or, or disappointed might be the wrong word, but um, searching for a better one. Uh, we don't want the Lord to be anticipating or expecting more from us and it not to come. Um, so those who are called, those who follow Christ are compelled to live as though Christ were already returned or had already returned. Um, there's a new way of life that comes crashing into the world. It comes crashing into to our existence. Christ, boom, he's on the scene, he's here, and therefore we should live differently even though he's gone. It's like um, if you've ever been looking and, 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 and getting ready to buy a car and it's, we'll say, you know, even earlier, I'd say sometime in August, September, you're looking to buy a car and you're thinking, okay, 22, 22 models, and you go to buy a car and they're like, boom, the 2023 model is here and it has all this stuff. Don't you want the 2023 model? It's like, well, it's only 2022. It's like, don't worry about that. That's just a date. You can have this idea of something in the future already coming. And then if you buy that model, it's like you're living in the future. It's like that you're doing something that somehow you cheated the system and you're there living. It's the same way for us. We don't actually have to have Christ's second coming in order for us to be living in the future. In order for us to be living as though he were already here, he were already present, that he were already uh, guiding us and encouraging us and saying, hey, there, now is the time. A new heaven and a new earth are being remade together, and you're, you get to be a part of it. You're an integral part of that remaking of heaven and earth. And so um, Paul then says, how do we do that? If we're, if we're called to something new, if we're called to live in this anticipation time, um, how do we do that? We, we anticipate Jesus Christ having already come. We live as if he's uh, already here again. Um, so you're going to do that by being people of the light. And so he outlines, what does it mean to be people of the light? Um, anything may be permissible to the world. The world can do whatever it wants. And he lists some things. Um, he lists uh, drunkenness and revelry, like, I don't know, just fighting and bickering. He lists um, being sexually immoral. Um, he lists uh, um, uh, jealousy. Uh, drunkenness, he lists all these different things, and he's like, okay, that's what the world does, and how you're going to live like people in light is you're just going to not do that stuff. And so the first thing is, is kind of a things that we don't do, but um, anything is permissible to the world, but we're meant to look different. And Jill had mentioned the shoebox uh, blessings that, uh, or, uh, or I guess she mentioned the gifts for Jesus, but there's also the shoebox blessings that we do, when we put together a little shoebox stuff, and we go and deliver those. And I remember um, I was talking with Teresa about this recently, but I remember we were walking through Catalpa area, and we were giving some of those away, and a guy, a guy took the box, and he said, well, why are you giving this to me? He said, we just want to, you know, greet you and, and tell you that Jesus loves you, and if you'd like to come to church, you're welcome. Uh, if you're not ready for that, just know that you're being prayed for. And he opened the box, and there was nothing special in there. And it was a young man, probably in his mid-20s. And I'll tell you, he cried right there. He said, why would you do that? Why would you do that? He said, well, because Jesus loves you. Because he loves, he loves us and he, he loves you. And we just want to make sure that you heard that. And 
I don't know that we get those opportunities every single day, but wouldn't it be fantastic if, if it was a regular occasion that whenever you just were living your life as you normally do, if you're just going about your day as you normally do, people said, why would you do that? Why would you be kind to me when you didn't have to be kind? Why would you be giving? Why would you be generous? Why would you be loving? Why would you be forgiving when you didn't have to be forgiving? Remember a time when somebody wronged me and did something that, that hurt me deeply. And this was another believer. And, and they came to me finally and, and, and uh, never really asked forgiveness. But I just told them, hey, I forgive you. And this person, kind of being a um, social elder uh, to me, uh, wept and said, man, I didn't know if I could forgive someone who did to me what I did to you, but, but I, know, I know that it's only Christ that allows you to do that. Can you imagine what it would be like if every day things that we've done, you've probably done this and didn't know it, and most of the time it would probably be that you wouldn't know people said this, but wouldn't it be great if just living your life, doing what you're supposed to do, following Christ as close as you could, people would say, why would you do that? And you'd have the chance to say, hey, Jesus loves you. That's how we're meant to live. Um, weren't you attracted to, to the Christian faith by the faith of others? Weren't you attracted to the Christian faith by the love and the compassion and the mercy other people gave you? Weren't you attracted to those, to, to, to Christ because of the people that you saw? If that's not the case, or you don't realize it's the case, it would be a unique situation, but normally it's through other people. And so if we're called to be people of the light, it's for the purpose of bringing them towards Christ, because Christ is the light of the world. Um, so be the reason that someone else comes to know Christ. As we move into a, just a closing time, I want to invite the worship team to make their way back up. Um, being people of the light means that we're, we, there's things that we do and there's things that we don't do. We need to look different, to be different, um, but also to, to not be people who are defined by the darkness. You know, um, Paul uses this because the, the, the major, one of the major uh, people that were uh, worshipped, one of the major gods that was being worshipped in Rome was, was Dionysus. And Dionysus' followers had specific type of clothing that they wore. Um, they, they had special kinds of haircuts and things that they would do. And, and actually, this isn't unusual. Whenever someone had disciples or followers, and this goes even to like Plato and Socrates, Socrates and, and those guys before Christ and who weren't even really religious, although their following seems kind of somewhat what, that way, their followers were encouraged to dress like them and to look like them and, and employ their mannerisms of speaking and of, of walking and doing different things. And so they, their disciples really looked like them. And this was the same for Christ. You can imagine, he, he says, don't carry all these things, these extra things. And they would have started to look a little bit like him at least. And um, especially, you know, with the fact that they were only allowed to wear just kind of one simple thing and, and, and they didn't have all, these, uh, all this excess. And so even Christ's followers, the disciples we think of, they would have probably looked something like Christ. But so back to the Romans, Paul is saying, hey, you need to put on the clothes of Christ. You need to realize that you wear his clothes, and every single place that you go, people are looking at you through that lens. So you want to look like Christ, and you also realize that people can identify you as a Christ follower based on the clothes that you wear. Um, so we want to look like Christ did, we want to act like he did, we want to love as he did. And as we go into just a brief moment of prayer, and we close in this final song, I want to ask you, do you, do you ever look out and see a need or a, we'll say a lack of justice, a lack of mercy, a lack of love? Do you look at your own life and, and, and have hope of when some restoration will come? Are you facing financial or spiritual or physical difficulties in your life and you're thinking, can't Christ just come now and fix all these problems? So imagine now for those who don't know Christ, 
those who don't follow. Imagine for them what it's like looking out into the darkness of the world and saying, there is absolutely nothing for me. There is no hope. Wouldn't it be great if if you could be that hope for them? So bring the kingdom. Be a part of bringing the kingdom that we believe in, the kingdom that we're waiting for, and not necessarily a part of the kingdom that we're in. In this Advent season, we're anticipating what the kingdom will be like, what heaven will be like when it's here in our midst, when Jesus comes again. Let's live as if that kingdom were here, as opposed to just living in the place that we're at. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your love is immeasurable, that your mercy and grace are overflowing to us each and every single day. We thank, we're thankful also for the power of the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, that even though we're in this time of hope and anticipation and of waiting and saying, Lord, will you ever come? Even if we were to start taking bets, if we were to start gambling, and we probably, most of us, would bet that you wouldn't be here tomorrow. And yet, Lord, we're so desperately waiting that you'd come, for you to come. God, we ask that you would move in our lives move in our hearts, move in our families, move in our church first, that we would experience your resurrection power, we'd experience the Holy Spirit again in our lives, that we would be able to say, I'm going to live as a person of the light today. I'm going to throw off the clothes of of unfaithfulness. I'm going to throw off the clothes of of idols. I'm going to throw off the clothes of worship of of this world that we're in and I'm going to put on the new clothes of Jesus Christ and I'm going to follow him wherever he leads. Lord, help us to be those people this morning so that even one, maybe hundreds would be great, but even one person would look at us and say, why would you do this? They would look at us and see you and not understand what they're seeing and and be drawn close to you instead, Lord. Help us to be building your kingdom in this place. We can't do it by our own power or our own strength. In fact, we can't even get our own lives together without your power and your love and your mercy and your grace. But we know that you're willing to do it in us and through us for your glory. Help us as we wait, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Why don't you stand as we continue to worship?
is filled with wisdom and the grace of God is on you. Jesus, this morning we begin our preparation for your birth, trusting in your promise to bless us with your light. God of goodness and love, we thank you for your promises. Like Gavin said, help us live the next month as if you are really coming. Living with that conviction and hope, this prayer in Jesus' name.